If you've ever found yourself chasing a loss or spending more time and money than you can afford on gambling, then you might have a gambling problem. In a world full of temptation, it can be difficult to maintain control. And fighting addiction can be really tough for you and your loved ones. Gamban can remove temptation by blocking your devices from accessing gambling websites and apps wherever you are in the world. Easy to install and non-intrusive. Gamban is a helpful tool for tackling gambling addiction. Gamban can help you get back on your feet and give you the time you need to enjoy the more important things in life. Watch, I'm gonna do it this time. <clears throat> Here we go. Hi everyone, I'm Christina and I last placed a bet March shit. <laughs> Uh, okay, here we go. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina, and I last placed a bet March 6th, 2021. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Bet Free Life. I'm Christina, and I last placed a bet. Did I sound drunk? <laughs> it just sounded like everything just kind of ran together. <laughs> See, Dave, okay. this is what we do week in and week out. Warning, this show may be triggering for anybody experiencing gambling-related harm. Please watch cautiously. We speak from our experiences only. Please seek professional help for a gambling addiction. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bet Free Life. I'm Christina, and I last placed a bet March 6th, 2021. And I'm Brian, and I last placed a bet in July of 2014. Christina! Brian! Guess what song I'm thinking of? It goes like this. Country road, take me home to oh. the place I belong. West Virginia. West Virginia. Mountain mama, love that take song. me home. Country road. And the reason is, is because I was in West Virginia last week and they had a bit of a retreat for people in gambling recovery, whether you were a day or 30 years and they opened it up and people like Arnie Wexler, who's been on this show, uh, zoomed in to run a session and somebody that our guest knows very well was there as well. So it's been, uh, it, it was a cool, you always feel good when you leave a, a place of recovery so that's how good i feel i feel good other than the fact that you can tell that i'm sick because my voice is shit right now but uh <laughs> how, how is something like that i want to do something like that i've never i haven't been to a retreat or anything like that it's amazing and so i have to thank the good people of west virginia for letting me uh crash the party because it was wonderful god bless first choice services they put on a good retreat and what like just give me a quick run through like what's that look like you get there, there's a session, everybody goes around, says, hey, I'm so-and-so, and I haven't gambled in this long. And some of the people are like four days, and some of the people are like, I haven't gambled in 16 years. And then the uh, person running the show gets up there and talks. And uh, when we all go to dinner, and we all chit-chat with each other about certain gambling and whatnot. And then it's just a lot of sessions. The whole theme was seeds and growing seeds and flourishing seeds. So there was a lot of talk about like, you got to have good soil and you got to water it and care for it. And so it was, it was, it was wonderful. I painted, um, those little, uh, flower pots. I painted a bunch of them cause it was uh, one of the sessions. There was an acupuncture session. There was, uh, interesting. I did I'm down some counseling. I sat down for some counseling and, and talked to my, yeah. Talked to somebody's ear off for 45 minutes to an hour. That's great. Yeah. And then I made some new friends and I saw some old friends. So it was, it was really great. Yeah. Maybe they'll invite me next year. Uh, you know, I begged my way in. You got to beg your, <laughs> you can't, it's not like they were I'll like, Hey, it. Brian, we it. understand that you're on YouTube. Like anybody else could be. <laughs> it was right. no, I begged my way. In. I was like, Hey, West Virginia, I hear you do this thing. Can I come and see it in person, please? I'm, I'm not above groveling. I wouldn't be, I'm not even to experience something like that. That sounds, that sounds amazing. And I walked I out think, of there full hearted and ready to go. And it was wonderful. Yeah. Worth it. Yeah. 
But tonight we have somebody who knows the person who was running the show down in West Virginia over the weekend. Uh, Dave is here. Dave Yeager is here. He is not only lived experience. He's not only somebody who served in the army. He's also somebody who has his own podcast as well, Christina, just like you and I do. And it's called Fall In, the Problem Gambling Podcast for Military Service Members and Veterans. And I'm always amazed when I get that correct. Dave, welcome to the Bet Free Life. We love that you're here because we wanted you here for so long. Thanks for doing this. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Christina, for having me on. I'm super excited to be doing this. Dave, tell us your date of recovery. And so everybody has an idea of where you are at. Okay. Uh, Yeah, I've been in recovery since January 6th of 2020. Very nice. And Dave, um, if I may, I hope I'm not spilling the beans on anything, but you did experience uh, both a relapse and you do have experience with suicidal ideation slash an attempt, correct? I do. I do. Yeah. And the only reason I say that out loud is because we talk a lot. We just talked about relapses on here. And so I just think it's so important when, when somebody like yourself with that sort of experience can come on and talk about it. And uh, I hope I didn't say anything too much. No, not at all. Okay, good. Um, would you tell us a little bit about your gambling and, and those previous two things that were mentioned? Sure. Sure. It's actually kind of a, it's like a tale of two addictions, really. Um, originally, first of all, just to give you some background, I like to give a little bit of background because I think it's important to my addiction is I grew up in an extremely, extremely dysfunctional home. So my mom divorced when we were real young, got remarried. <clears throat> Long story short, she married an abuser. Um, so I spent most of my childhood being abused, uh, terribly, which led me to not talk about things. It led me to kind of hide from things It led me to hide my emotions because one of the problems was for me is if I showed emotion, I got beat for it. So I learned very quickly kind of how to keep it in and not say a whole lot. Um, I think that's important to know as I move forward, because, you know, I went through a lot of years of that. Um, I left the house when I was a teenager because I, you know, they, my parents were moving to a different school district and I found a family I could move into to finish my schooling. It just turns out that the family I moved in with was no better because the mother was an abusive mother and the, and the father, um, had a fetish for young boys that he played out on me, which I'm not going to go into detail on because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get too graphic. Let's just say it was not a good time for me. So, and then finally, I took myself out of that situation, finally got myself into a good situation and had a number of good years after that, but the groundwork was kind of already laid. Um, Fast forward, um, went through high school, went to college for a year, went out and worked, ended up going into the army um, in 1987, got out in 1991. Nothing really happened during that time. But between then and the time I went back in the army in 1998, I got married and had two kids. Um, The woman that I married, it was a, it was a, it was a turbulent relationship from day one. Um, And so when I left, I came down on orders for Korea in 2001 and left for Korea right after 9-11. And when I left, I had two young kids, both under the age of five. Um, I had been arguing and fighting with my first wife, got on the plane, flew 12 hours away. So I was off on my time. I was away from, I knew I was away from my kids for a year, um, landed in country over there. I was tired. I was frustrated. I was angry. They put me up in a super nice hotel, um, on the base in Seoul, Yongsan base in Seoul. It was a nice hotel. And if anybody's ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I wasn't ready. I couldn't go to sleep. I was too worked up to go to sleep, but I was tired and, uh, got something to eat walking around and lo and behold, as I'm walking around, I find a, basically a casino style slot room right there on the first floor of the hotel on the base. So I'm like, okay, this is cool. Um, Never really had had a problem with it. I mean, I'm from Pennsylvania. I grew up a couple hours from Atlantic city. I'd been to Atlantic city a few times. It wasn't a big deal for me when my twenties, when I was younger, I'm like, all right, I'll take some money out. I'll go in here. I'll sit down and I'll try to shrug off some of this stuff I'm going through right now. Um, And as I was sitting down, the first thing I noticed was, okay, I'm relaxing. I'm kind of loosening up a little bit, but then I think I made the biggest mistake a budding compulsive gambler can make. And I won money. Um, 
And I don't remember the amount, but it wasn't a whopper. I'll tell you that. But it was enough that in that moment, I can remember kind of all that crap just washing away. You know, all the frustration, all the anger, all the stress, all the fear of being where I was post 9-11. You know, because as soon as I got in country, everything's barricaded off. You're walking around with, um, you know, basically protective gear on most of the time. It's just it was a very stressful time. And I can just remember that stress melting away in that moment. Um, and I'm convinced that's the moment where it all began. I'm convinced that's kind of was the spark that got things going. And I won't say it happened overnight, but over the course of the next year, it did get progressively worse because there are those little slot rooms on pretty much all the bases in Korea and in a lot of the bases overseas. Um, so it developed from on a Saturday night, I would go to then on a Saturday, Sunday night on a go, then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then almost every night of the week. Then I would start to go on my lunch break. Um, then I would start to make excuses that I had meetings because I was the non-commissioned officer in charge of my unit. So I'd say, I have a, me a meeting I need to go to. And I'd go over to the slot room to telling my ex, giving her different reasons to send me more money. Like, Hey, one of my guys needs money. They need help to then borrowing money from my subordinates, which if you know anything about the military, that's one of the hugest no, no's you, you just don't do it. You don't do it. And I did it to eventually stealing from my own unit. Um, that got me put on a suicide watch um, that got me demoted. Um, and the weird part about it was it got me demoted, but at the same time I had had a, um, uh, an evaluation done, got a really good evaluation all for all except for one category, which was character, right? Because they knew there was a problem. They knew I took money from the unit. They knew I had admitted to it, but yet I was doing all this other good stuff at the same time. It was so Jekyll and Hyde. It was just bizarre. Um, so I did get, they, they demoted me, they dropped me down one rank and they sent me on my way. That was pretty much all that happened to me. I got dropped a rank and sent on to my next unit, um, got to my next unit. And over time it developed again, it re, it, it re reared its ugly head, um, to the point where while I was at, stationed in South Carolina, um, I took a whole lot of pills one day and ended up in the hospital. It was the first of four attempts for me to take my own life because I just couldn't, I didn't know what was happening to me. I knew it was happening, but I didn't know why it was happening. And nobody seemed to be able to give me an answer. So I'm like, I just, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I had two young kids. I had a, a wife who I fought with constantly, you know, let me just take some pills. And I, and part of it might've been a cry for help. You know, as I look back, that's more than likely what it was, but it did land me in the hospital and the weirdest part about it was nothing again really happened. I was told to go find a counselor, civilian counselor, which I did. I found a counselor that I could manipulate and get them to listen to what I say and bod, nod their head and let me go about my business. So I really didn't have to give any of myself. All I had to do was show up and I was left alone. Um, and it, it again, it settled down for a while, but then it kind of built itself back up again to the point where when I went on to my next station down in Texas, my ex actually stayed where she was in South Carolina. She just didn't, she wasn't ready to move down there with me. She felt like it was a bad time in our relationship. And I'm going to be honest, I didn't fight her because I was too busy wanting to gamble. I didn't want to, I didn't want her coming with me because it's easier to hide stuff when you're not right there. Um, and that's what it had become. It was all hiding, lying, manipulating, you know, all the things that, that, many of us do in terms of the gambling addiction. So I get down to Texas and lo and behold, it rears its ugly head again. This time I started doing the same things. I borrowed from subordinates. I stole from my unit. Um, and then attempt number two takes place while I'm down there because it all came to a head when I, when they started to investigate the theft. Um, I admitted to it again. Um, this time I was staying in a room with these brick walls and I can remember it. And this was, I, I'm going to describe this and it's a, it's a bit, it's a bit graphic, but just bear with me on this is, is what I decided to do was I got a good running. I had a, about a six foot span between my bed and my wall. So I got a good running start and just ran myself into my wall head first about six times. Um, basically trying to break my own neck. Um, I didn't succeed. I ended up going to the hospital. I ended up telling them I needed help and got put into a civilian acute psych ward obviously. I mean, I was suicidal at the time. So they put me in there. 
sedated me. Um, got, pro got probably the best night's sleep I'd had in months. Um, but then while I was there for two weeks, my commander and my battalion commander show up and they again demoted me right in the conference room of the psych ward. And again, my commander said to me, he says, I just don't know what to do here. He said, because you're a stellar performer, but yet this is happening and we have to do something about it, which he's right. They had to do something about what I did because I was a non-commissioned officer and I, I performed in a way that was unbecoming a non-commissioned officer. And if I were in his shoes, I would have had to do the same thing. So I didn't blame him for that. So, but what they did ultimately was at that point, they let me out of the army. They basically what's called chaptered me out of the army, um, but did it under honorable conditions. So I could at least pursue veterans benefits to try and get treatment for what was going on for me. And I'm to this day, I got to be honest, I'm super grateful for that. Um, which I'll talk about in a second here. Uh, so I get out, um, I drive right, I make a stop in South Carolina to see my kids, but I drive right up to Pennsylvania because at that point we were separated. My ex and I were separated. <clears throat> got up to Pennsylvania, got myself into a job. Over the next few years, went through four jobs, mostly because they were interfering with my gambling. So I just quit the job and moved on to another one. Uh, the gambling addiction got gradually worse. Another attempt later, um, then I, I go into the VA and this was an interesting because I had gone out, um, to the casino with a lot of money with me. It wasn't a huge chunk. It was about 500 bucks. I went with, I ended up spending 36 hours straight in the casino. I had no idea. I thought I was there overnight. I didn't realize I was there for 36 hours. Um, ran out of money, of course, drove myself back took a whole whole bottle of antidepressants, which if you know anything about antidepressants, if you take a whole bottle of those, you can throw yourself into seizures and kill yourself real quick. Well, I ended up taking myself to the hospital. I was there overnight. I got to drink a whole lot of charcoal, which I don't ever recommend. Um, got up the next day, realized there was a paycheck in my mailbox, signed myself out against medical advice, went there, took the paycheck out of the mailbox, cashed it while my head's still spinning and buzzing from everything that I had done and drove back to the casino and spent another 12 hours there. Um, that's how sick I had become at that point. Um, you know, this, it was just, it was tearing me to pieces. At that point, I hadn't spoken to my children. When all that happened, I hadn't spoken to my children in about a year. Um, all told, I, I lost contact with my kids for over two years, had zero contact with my own children for two years. Uh, part of it was I was too ashamed and guilty to even want to talk to them. And part of it was my ex at the time had met somebody else after she left me and he talked her into taking away my parental rights, which you can do in South Carolina. So literally, according to the state of South Carolina, I was no longer the parent of these children, even though they kept my name. And even though now today, I have great relationships with both of them. Um, I had lost contact with them. And at this point, I reached a point where I'd kind of reached rock bottom. And I knew I can't do it. I got to do something. I've, I've been trying to fight this on my own. I've been trying to smart my way through it. Like I spent 11 years in the army. I should be able to power my way through this and get through this. It doesn't work that way. We all know that it doesn't work like that. So I finally said, I got to find something. So I go to the VA and all I remember is the VA I went to originally, they draw me these little behavior circles, these little belief circles and try to teach me how to change beliefs. I'm like, that's great. What are you going to do about my gambling problem? Um, you know, and they kept moving me person to person until finally somebody said to me, did you ever hear of the gambling treatment program? And in, in, uh, at the time it was Brexville, Ohio. I said, nope, never heard of it. So they gave me a bundle of paperwork and said, here, go, go check into it. I mean, nobody made calls for me or anything. They just gave me the packet of paperwork and sent me on my way. Thank God there were two names written in there who were the two directors of the program at the time. One of them is still there. Um, and the other has moved since moved on, but I'm going to go ahead and say their names. Um, it's Dr. Lori Rugel and Dr. Heather Chapman. Um, so I called the first number on there, which was Dr. Rugel's number, Got a hold of somebody, ended up getting screened, ended up going out there in June of 2007. I made it to Brexville, Ohio, got myself checked in. And for the first time since all this was going on for that six years, I finally felt like somebody understood what the heck was going on with me. Because up until that point, nobody knew what to do with me. Nobody, nobody in the military, nobody in the VA system until finally I stepped into the Brexville hospital. Somebody finally knew. Um, so I went through treatment there. 
I did the inpatient treatment. I stayed for outpatient treatment. In fact, I was there for two years in Cleveland. Um, went to GA meetings, was getting healthy, was feeling really good. Um, brought my way back to Pennsylvania. And I got to tell you a little bit of a backstory. <clears throat> um, before I had gone into the treatment center in Cleveland, I, one of the places I worked for, one of the companies I worked for, I stole a lot of money from. Um, I turned myself in to that and they had me on a repayment system. Um, kind of, I don't know if you ever heard of ARD, which is a rehabilitative type of a, a you know, a probation. And I let that go while I was in Cleveland. So when I came back to Pennsylvania, I actually got arrested for it um, and ended up getting full prosecution for what I had done years before because I didn't even pay my money while I was in treatment. I completely let that go and didn't pay the money. So that happened when I got back to PA. Um, and, but at the same time, I was still engaged in recovery. I was still doing well. I still felt good. But by that point, I had kind of started giving up on meetings. I had given up on my aftercare. I wasn't really talking to anybody anymore. I, I thought, you know, you know, obviously the three biggest mistake words I could ever say to myself, I got this. So I thought I had it. So fast forward a little bit. I went through all that. I got through my probation. I did well with that. <clears throat> um, reconnected with the woman that I'm married to now. She was my high school sweetheart back years and years and years ago. And we had reconnected and instantly had a connection with each other. Um, reconnected with her, reconnected with my children and started building relationships with them. But the whole time, little by little, my addiction was coming back because I wasn't focusing on my recovery. So, and, and the way it kind of came back was, as opposed to just going out and hitting casinos, what I was doing now was I was manipulating money. So I would say to her, I'd take her out to an extravagant meal and she'd be like, can we afford this? And I'd be like, yeah, we got this. Meanwhile, I went out and got my own credit card without telling her about it, right? Paid for it on that credit card. So it didn't use our household income we were paying bills with, but then how do I pay the credit card bill? All right. Well, then I went out and took a loan to pay the credit card bill off so that the credit cards paid off, but now I have this loan. So now I take a second loan to pay off the first loan the whole time thinking, you know, the, the gambler's thought process of I'll find a way to fix this before I have to say anything it just kept going through my head to the point where eventually I did go out and I gambled again to try and make this money up. Um, I'm going to be honest, the feeling when I went out was very different than it was the first time I physically gambled. This time it was a desperation move to try to pay off debts that I had created for myself. But what I will say is when I was creating all this debt, when I was driving home early to check my mailbox every day before anybody got home so I could get all the bills before anybody saw them, there was a risk involved there. There was an adrenaline involved there that was reminiscent of the days when I was out gambling. You know, the kind of that, that risk reward thing was happening. Um, that got progressively worse through the latter part of 2019. It just exploded and got really bad to the point where I was gambling again to try and make the money back. And of course, same cycle, I would lose every time. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, I, I started to get on social media and I saw these quote unquote philanthropists that would help people out that were in struggling situations. Well, dumb me, I got involved with a scammer um, and I knew it. I, I in, in the back of my mind, I knew exactly what I was doing, but I was so desperate at that point. I'm like, hey, maybe this can work out. Well, it didn't work out. And it got to the point that uh, January 3rd, 2020, uh, it was a Friday. I was home. I told my wife I was sick and that I was sitting on my couch and I spent the entire weekend on my couch. And I was trying to decide between one of two things. I had a big knife in my pocket I had gotten from the American Legion being a veteran. I had that thing laser sharpened. And I was either going to walk to the back of my property and end it, or I was going to step back into recovery and move forward. And Brian, you've heard this story. I think, Christine, you've heard this story, too. Um, as I'm sitting there over the course of the weekend, um, Morgan Freeman's voice from Shawshank Redemption pops into my head and says, get busy living or get busy dying. Um, God is my witness. That happened. And I chose to get busy living, obviously. So on January 6th, I turned myself in to acute psych over at the VA local to me. I confessed 90% of what I had done to my wife. Uh, the rest came out later, um, got myself back into treatment at what now is the Cleveland 
gambling treatment program in February of 2020, <clears throat> which went through to March. Got myself into a GA group, actually two at the time. One has gone completely virtual, but I'm still a member of the other one, and I go faithfully every week. Um, found an online group that a good friend of ours hosts, and you guys have both been a part of, <laughs> um, and got myself into recovery. I got myself into recovery, and the biggest difference between what I did in 2020 and have done since and what I did in 2007 is I didn't take my recovery for granted. So I think in 2007, I knew I had a gambling problem. I think I knew in 2020, I was powerless over it. I think that's the difference. Um, so since then, fast forward now going on two and a half years, I go to my GA meetings every single week unless I'm somewhere else, unless I drive somewhere. I have online meetings access I have access to that I can go to whenever I want. I work part-time as an addiction treatment therapist and work with addict, addicted people all the time to the point where they've it's a drug and alcohol facility, but they've allowed me to do a weekly problem gambling awareness group and work individually with problem gamblers who are co-addicted. Um, you know, I have gotten back into advocacy, which I used to do prior to falling back into my addiction. So now I go out and I tell my story to people <clears throat> primarily with the hopes of improving care for military service members and veterans, because if I'm being honest, it sucks, um, especially for active duty service members. They just don't get the care that they need, and they're afraid to say anything. I'm working with a couple of active duty service members right now that I have contact with, and neither one of them is willing to step forward and say they have a problem because they're afraid of the debt, you know, the, the devastation it's going to do to their careers. Neither of them has done, they've done damage, they've, but they've not done damage to their units. So, so if they were had a drug or an alcohol problem, they would have been put into a drug or alcohol treatment program while on active duty with the hopes of rehabilitating them and getting them back out into the, into the workforce and, you know, with their unit with gambling. No, it's a, it's a money problem. You're getting kicked out. That's pretty much how it works. So these guys are afraid to say anything. So I'm actually working with people now. And that's a lot of what I advocate to do is to try to do that. Um, and then also in 2020 uh, connected with you, Brian, through your podcast and, just happened to mention on a whim, hey, Brian, what do you think about the idea of opening up one of these podcasts to deal with military service members and veterans, to which Brian said, hell yeah. Um, so that then from there, we created Fall In. Um, <clears throat> Fall In is for military service members and veterans. It's about military service members and veterans. We, we talk to experts in the field. Uh, we talk directly with people who are suffering from the addiction, although I'll be honest, it's hard to get people in there because they're just there's just not a lot of them willing to come forward and sit on the podcast. So, but you know, it's it's what it's there for. It's there to raise awareness around the fact that this is a huge issue in the military and we need to talk about it. So that's that's my story. That's that's me. That's who I am. Um, feel free to ask to fill in any blanks. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Well, I do, I do have a question though. Um, well, I mean, I always have several, but, you know, hearing your story and, you know, in 2020, when you entered recovery for what's hopefully the, the last time, um, is doing the service work, doing the advocacy, doing the podcast. Do you think that that's kind of been the transition to like, like, I feel like, I, you know, I tell people when they say all the time they struggle with recovery because they get bored. They, they're bored at home. They're bored. And I say, do service work, help others. Um, that a lot of times will kind of snap you out of that boredom. Do you think that that really kind of has made a difference in your recovery this time around compared to other times? Yeah. And there's a different reason for it because I had done some advocacy prior to that, prior to my relapse. The difference is connection. Um, the difference is I stay firmly anchored and connected to my recovery. I find different outlets for it. Um, I find different ways of doing it. Part of it is through the treatment center I work at um, because I, I'm constantly connected with people who are coming in raw. Um, part of it is my GA meeting, which I never really took seriously before, but now I get most, so much from it that I never got before. But yeah, a big part of it is the service work. A big part of it is trying to give back because 
when I hear one of these service members say to me, hey, by the way, I'm doing great. Just want you to know this is going on. Or they say to me, hey, I'm struggling with this. What do you think I can do? And I'm able to say something that they're able to use to help them get through that one little period. Yeah, that's huge. That's gigantic for me. So my answer this time around is absolutely. Um, there was When I first started doing advocacy, yes, I was very, it, you know, it was very, it felt like home is the best way I can put it. When I'm able to tell my story to try to help people, it feels like home to me. But then I kind of drifted away from it because I was falling into my addiction and I felt like I was faking it, which I was, you know, I felt like a hypocrite. So I pulled myself away from that as I was falling deeper and deeper into my addiction. The difference this time is I'm staying so firmly connected to my own recovery and I'm putting my recovery ahead of all of this other stuff that the the advocacy, the, the service work just enhances what I'm doing, it just makes it even better, keeps me even stronger. So absolutely. Yeah. Dave, what's. It's a bad way of asking, Dave, why does the military deal with alcohol and drugs and not gambling? I wish I knew the answer to that, Brian. Um, the only thing that what comes to mind here is alcohol and drugs are very visual and very obvious. Um, gambling is a money problem. Um, gambling is not being recognized as an addiction, even though it's in the DSM-5, even though it's it's been established as an addiction. <clears throat> um, the only thing I can think is that because it's more it's more looked at as a money problem, I just wonder, Brian... I think that the people in power know what's going on. I think that they know that this is an addiction. I think that they know that if they stepped into it, they could help. But if you don't want an answer, don't ask the question. So if we don't, you know, if we don't want to step into this and create true change and really put our dollars into educating our service members on problem gambling and then offering them treatment if they fall into it, then, then we don't have to put our focus on that right now. We can just say, you have a money issue. You have a readiness issue. We're going to sweep you out of the way and move on with the job. That I, I wish I had a better answer. I don't know what the answer is. That's just what's popping into my head. And I don't really, I don't really know how military life is, but I, you know, from the movies I've watched, um, you know, people I know. It's they, very different from that, by the way. <laughs> Well, my brother-in-law, he is a uh, retired Navy and now Air Force. And so I knew know a little bit from that, but, you know, they talk about the readiness, right? And being prepared and making sure that things at home are in good order, right? Before deployments and all that. Um, they, you know, they talk about that being such a big priority, right? Don't they? Family life, making sure things are good there. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't they offer like services to help and finances and, and, you know, give an outlet to talk about with problems. Do they offer like, what am I trying to say? Do they offer a service where people can come and say, look, I'm struggling with this at home and where somebody could bring up gambling and not as in a treatment way, but in a way to start the conversation? The, the answer is yes. Um, you know, there, there are organiza organizations out there and I can, you know, I was an army, I'm an army veteran. So the organization that comes to mind to me is army community service, which is a, it's a military organization. It's a government organization designed to help military service members and their family who are struggling with certain things like financial issues. They have financial counseling and that sort of thing. Um, there are counseling out there, there are websites that can lead you to counseling for things like problem gambling and whatnot. Um, there, there's two issues that I have with that. Number one, nobody comes out and says, you know, uses the word gambling as part of let's draw you in. If you're having an issue with gambling, bring, come here and we can help you. Nobody talks about that. You know, they'll say, if you want to learn how to balance a checkbook, go to ACS. You can learn how to, you know, balance your finances. They can give you a little financial coaching, that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, so while there are services out there and available, number one, they're they're limited. And number two, nobody's out there telling you about them, right? Whereas when you go, when you're in the military, you go through quarter, um, it's basically quarterly, semi-annual and annual training. 
And one of the things they do talk about, at least I can remember talking about, is the drug and alcohol program. Here's how the drug and alcohol program works. They have a whole regulation out on it on how it's run. Um, you know, there were different tracks that you go into. And yes, there's a track where if it's severe enough, we need they needed to take you out of the military. They needed to remove you. I can understand that. I get that. If an addiction is serious enough and it's done enough damage, okay, we need to remove you because now you really are interfering with readiness. Um, but if you're at beginning stages or you're just developing those stages, there's nobody out there saying, listen, if this is happening and we've got nine criteria in the DSM-5, we've got 20 questions for GA, we've got a whole, all these screening tools that all you have to say is, listen, here are five signs of a potential gambling problem. If any of these things are happening for you, come sit down and talk to us, right? You know, no judgment, no anything like that. Or here's an outlet you can go to to start talking about it before it becomes an issue before it gets to the point where you do damage to yourself, your family, or your unit, right? Because if it goes long enough, and, and even saying this in an education form, if a gambling addiction goes long enough, you're going to damage yourself, your family, and your career. Um, and we don't want that. So when these things, you know, start noticing these things happening, or buddies, battle buddies, if you start seeing your, your, your battle buddy, your friend, going out extensively, you know, you notice he's going to the casino every other night. You notice that he's borrowing money from people. It's time for you to say something to this person and it's time to lead them to help. That's what's missing. Okay. The help is out there. It's available. Again, it's, it's kind of limited and nobody is softening the blow to go to these places. So there's a giant fear to even step into it. Dave, can you talk about the slot machines on military bases? <laughs> yeah, I can talk about them all day. I used to live there. <laughs> um, there, And I don't know if, if or how they've changed, but it basically, if you walk into most casinos and you walk on the slot floor of a casino, it looks like that, just a smaller version of it. Um, the money that goes in there goes into what's called the Morale Welfare and Recreation Fund, the MWR Fund, which is great because it helps military service members and their families do recreational things, especially while you're stationed overseas. So you can take trips to other countries. You can go on boating trips. You can go on golf trips. You know, it, it helps to support all these activities, which is wonderful. But it's $100 million a year that not one penny of is put back into education or treatment of problem gambling. So none of that money is funneled back towards saying, putting posters up inside the casino room saying, hey, if this is happening, seek help. You know, you can't even they don't even print them out on paper and put them up on the walls. There's just there's no money being put back into it. And this is excuse me. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, only overseas, correct? This is not military bases. That's correct. Located on U.S. soil. <clears throat> That's correct. That I mean, it's it's almost now irrelevant given the access to gambling nowadays. I mean, people now one of the things in the military and I remember in ranges um, you know, you got done at the rifle range and you're waiting for your, your bus or your cattle car to show up to take you back. You know, you got downtime. There's a lot of downtime in the military that people don't realize. Um, and if somebody, people are allowed to have their phones with them, you can sit there and go to the casino while you're waiting for your transportation to arrive. You can go on the casino while your transportation's taking you back. You can go to the casino while you're sitting in the restroom, you know? So the overseas bases, while they're important to understand that some of that money should be funneled back into educating. They're almost irrelevant now, given the volume of ways that you can gamble. And here we go. So I just, because it's Memorial day weekend, right. You know, this weekend, as we're recording this, I just went to my local casinos website and one of the, under the deals section is military and first responders discounts. Mm -hmm. And that is very common with operators in specifically reaching out to military members and giving them discounts on hotel stays, casino visits, and any of that to get them in the door. Yeah. Seems kind of chitty based on what you said. 
of, about the lack of help for military members that I, were advertising directly to military members. Yeah, and I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I have mixed emotions about it, Brian, because I understand the idea. And for the 90 percent of people who can go out there and safely gamble, 90 plus percent of people, it, it's good for veterans to have those little extra perks if that's what you want to do to bring those people in. But at the same time, it's the same thing. You're talking about a vulnerable population. Um, you know, the number of people susceptible to problem gambling in the military, particularly, you know, for combat veterans and that sort of thing, is higher than it is for the general civilian population. So you're taking a vulnerable population and now you're offering them all these incentives to draw them in. It's a, it's a you know, it's a dangerous combination. Especially because some addictions can start like a wildfire. You know, uh, mine was a mine was a slow burn. I've, I've said that you know through my own story. Um, but I this the amount of stories I've heard where they've walked in and from the first time they gambled, it was just like a wildfire. It it their lives were destroyed within a year mm-hmm. of of just entering a casino for the first time. You know, just to have a good time. And so. I think when you, you're right, when you add that vulnerability to it, um, you know, because I think, what do they say? All addiction has trauma, but not all trauma equal ends in addiction. So it's, you know, people that experience, especially like you said, combat veterans and and things like that, people who've experienced real trauma um, are very susceptible. And I, I would think that that they would understand that or would hope that they would understand that it'd be great if we could get like the, the 20 questions on like every door, right? Like before you enter, (laughs) can you, how many of these are you answering yes to? Yeah. If you could just do a, please be aware. I mean, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I don't necessarily, I don't have a problem with the gambling industry. If you want to, you know, this is, especially here in the United States, this is a, you know, it's a capitalist society. You go out and make yours. Just have a little bit of responsibility because you're stepping into an industry where you know, you know, you're doing damage to people, to a percentage of the population. It's not a mystery. You're not guessing it. We're not saying it's possible. You are doing damage to a percentage of the population. So there should be some response, especially with an entertainment type field like this, there should be some level of responsibility to educate, screen and treat these people, you know, to funnel back into giving back to to say, just put the sign on the wall, be aware of, you know, or have the person trained in the casino to walk around and see that person and say, listen, it just feels like you're here a little too much, but it's and maybe those people are out there. I don't know, but I'm not hearing about them. So, yeah, I, I'm with you when you when you're when you when you have an industry that promotes a potentially dangerous entertainment activity, at least have the systems in place to help those people when you have a, the susceptible population starts to get affected. Damn right. And for me, the U.S. government should be the first activity that should step into that and say, we need to take responsibility for our people. Just my opinion. And that's where it's lacking the most in federal in federal aid and federal acknowledgement. That's where it's non-existent. Yeah. Yeah. If you make an example of that in the MWR system and in the military system, that can spread its way out. That if you show a model that works to where these these facilities can still make money, but are turning some of it back to help people and you're reducing the amount of people that are you know, losing careers or losing families and are losing lives over it, but you're still making money on it and you can show the industry that it's possible. Why not set the example? Why not blaze the trail? Amen. Dave, can you talk a little bit about uh, the podcast and how somebody might get a hold of you if they wanted to talk about gambling and military matters on the podcast or find the podcast And for me, could you just talk about in general how talking about your addiction has helped you? Yeah, I'll start with the podcast. First of all, if you if you do want to get a hold of me, if you are a veteran, if you're an active duty service member or if you're somebody who works with either of those fall in podcast at gmail dot com, F-A-L-L-I-N podcast at gmail dot com. Email me anytime um, and I'll connect with you and we'll see what you know what we can do to get you on there. 
<clears throat> um, it's so important to get this message out, especially if you are a service member or a veteran who, who has struggled with a gambling addiction and you're willing to tell your story, please tell your story if you're willing. Um, again, if it's going to affect your recovery, no, your recovery comes first. If you're that, if you're that hesitant to, to not want to do it, I'm willing to tell your story anonymous, anonymously without names. I can tell it for you. I can even leave out certain details as long as we get the prior, you know, the primary parts of the story out there, the most important parts of the story. But it's so important that we get this message out there because our holding back, our not talking about it, is part of the reason we're not getting treatment for it. Um, is because that you know it takes, <laughs> you know, it, it, it takes a village, and right now we don't have a village. We just got a couple of people, and when I am the most notable person. For military veterans struggling with a gambling addiction, I shouldn't be that guy. I should not be that guy. I should be among many, many people. I should be one voice among many. So I'm trying to surround myself with those voices. Um, as far as talking about it, it, I can't tell you enough how important talking about my addiction is to keep me in my recovery because it keeps me accountable to keep <laughs> doing the things that I'm doing to stay in recovery. Um, when I allow myself to hide, uh, I will. If I don't keep myself accountable, if I don't talk about what's going on with me, I'll hide. And the more I start to hide, it starts off small. It's nothing real big. But the more I hide the little things, the more I start hiding the bigger things, the more I start hiding the bigger things, the closer I get to falling back into my addiction. So talking about it is, is not just important. It's critical. It absolutely has to happen for me. Addiction thrives in isolation. Amen. The connection is key. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I, I can't stress that enough, the, the importance of, and, and for me, telling my story, I, I, I don't fear telling my story. I know there are a lot of people who might, and that's fine. I'm, I'm not criticizing anybody. It's, there's no judgment there. We all have to be where we are. But for me, I'm, bring it. I'll tell my story anytime. Um, I'm not going to stand in my, in my daytime workplace and tell my story because it's a totally different field I work in. But, you know, to anybody who wants to listen where I can make a difference, I'm not going to hide anything. That's great. It's that recovering out loud. Uh, you know, not, not a lot of people feel comfortable doing it. And I'm grateful for the ones mm. that, that are able to do it and, and help others. As am I. Yep. Right there with you. Well, Dave, uh, thank you so much for joining us and talking about the fall in podcast and your own story, which, uh, you made this easy for us, Dave. We didn't have to do a lot of asking of questions because you put it all out there and I can't thank you enough for doing that because that's really key. I think for people to hear somebody like yourself, hear the struggles that you've had talking about your own suicidality and your relapse. And so I think hearing other people struggle helps people. And so I thank you very much for talking about your struggles out loud. It's really nice to hear that. So that way we can all recover out loud together. So thank Amen you. Amen to that. And it's an honor to be able to do it. I very much appreciate the, what you guys are doing to get this out there. Thank you. Well, you know, it, it's, it's like one of those, we were all doing podcasts individually and then we're talking and we're like, oh, we should move into video to put a face on it. And then Christina's like, we should move into TikTok. And it's just like, it's, it's just ongoing. Like wherever you can talk about the addiction, talk about it because it's going to help somebody. And why so, not? Why not? Yeah. Why not? Why not? If you're willing and you've got the means, why not do it? Well, uh, check out the Fallen podcast. I'm sure we have displayed it on this at this point, um, and we'll put a link to it as well. Dave Yeager, thank you so much for joining the Bet Free Life. Really appreciate it. All your hard work in trying to get uh, gambling addiction in the military easier for those who are suffering. Brian and Christina, thank you for having me on. It's again, it's been an honor and a pleasure. I, this is great. And for Christina, I'm Brian. Thanks for watching. Talking helps, so do it. Hashtag, hashtag talking helps. Hashtag talking helps.
<laughs> Pow!